Could I just remind all members, please, to mute their microphones? Thank you. Right, I'm, I think we're live now. And so the meeting has commenced. Item one on the agenda of this special meeting is apologies for absence. Debbie, do we have any apologies? Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from Councillor Rob Humby and from Honorary Alderman Brunette Dickens. Are there any other apologies for absence which members are aware of? Good, then we go to item two, which is declarations of interest. All members who believe they have a pecuniary interest in any matter to be considered at this meeting must declare that interest and having regard to part the paragraph 1.5 of the County Council for members code of conduct, they should leave the meeting while the matter is discussed, save for exercising any right to speak in accordance with paragraph 1.6 of the code. Furthermore, all members with a personal interest in the matter being considered at the meeting should consider having regard to part 5, paragraph 4 of the code, whether such interest should be declared, and having regard to part five, paragraph five of the code, should consider whether it is appropriate to leave the meeting while the matter is discussed, save for exercising any right to speak in accordance with the code. If you do leave the meeting, would you please mute your camera so that only your photograph is shown and not everything all around you as you leave the meeting, and then remember to come back on again. Item three is minutes. There are no minutes on this occasion to be confirmed. So I move now to item four, uh, which is the consideration of honorary alderman confirmation. And I pass over to the leader to present this report and move the recommendation. Councillor Mayor. Thank you, Chairman. And may I congratulate you on your first full council meeting of this council year. Chris Connor was first elected as a county councillor for Basingstoke North West, representing the Labour Party in 1985, and served until 1989. He returned as a county councillor for Basingstoke Central from 2013 until 2017. In his first term of office, Chris sat on the Education Committee and its associated subcommittees for education buildings, further education, schools, and the Northeast and Northwest Hampshire Area Building Board from 1985 to 1986. He was also a member of the Public Protection Board of Committee. In between his terms, Chris served as a co-opted member from Basingstoke and Dean Borough Council on the Education Committee. From 2013 to 2017, Chris was leader of the Labour Group on the County Council during this time, Chris was a member of the Hampshire Pension Fund panel and board, and was also the Labour spokesperson on policy and resources and the Children and Young People Select, People's Select Committee and the Regulatory Committee. As part of the Electoral Review Members Working Group, Chris contributed to the work of the further Electoral Review of the County Council, carried out by the Local Government Boundary Commission for England, from 2015 to 2016. Chris represented the County Council on Basingstoke Voluntary Services outside body and for many years has given his support to the work of the Hampshire Music Service. It gives me great pleasure, Chairman, to recommend that the County Council confirm, confer the title of Honorary Alderman on former County Councillor Christopher Connor. Thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, councillor, do, do any councillors wish to speak on this item? I have. Councillor Still has raised her hand. Councillor Still? I just want to say well done, Chris. He's done a fantastic job for Basingstoke and uh, I'm really pleased he's got this amazing uh, award. Thank you, Councillor Frankham. 
Thank you. I would like to say that this is well deserved for uh, Chris Connor and also for the work that he did for children with special needs and in the music service. Um, he did a, a, a lot more than obviously was, um, was given out and it's well deserved and apparently it's only the second Labour Alderman uh, that the, the county have um, acknowledged. So it just shows how very special he is and thank you, he really does deserve it. Thank you, Councillor Franklin. Councillor Reid. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I'd like to offer my congratulations to Chris. We have worked against each other for many years uh, and uh, we've often enjoyed uh, sitting uh, and uh, telling together uh, and the conversations have always been very uh, amenable. I was talking earlier this morning to Honorary Alderman Keith Chapman, who sends Chris his best wishes as well uh, and thanks him for his service to the Hampshire Music Service. Um, this is a, a well-deserved award. Thank you. Councillor Westbrook. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it, was a, it was a great privilege for me as the former leader of the Labour group to put forward Chris's name for this uh, title. Chris had um, probably would have still been with us doing the job today had it not been for his illness, um, but Chris was making a good recovery. And I think, you know, he's, he's, he's really up there in our thoughts. Um, one of the interesting facts, I think you, you pointed out, Chairman, that, that he'd been a county councillor before. Not many people probably realise that. And the interesting point for me was that as you enter the chamber to the council on the left hand side on the board, the old board, his name is up there in, in gold leaf. So um, I can just echo everything else that Chris has done and his continued support for, for children, people with disabilities, and in particular, the music service, which he still gets around to this day. Um, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Haas. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And uh, we very much from the Liberal Democrat group support Chris Connor's nomination for uh, being an honorary alderman. Uh, Chris's dry sense of humour was always fantastic in the council chamber, and we worked well over the course of the time that he was on uh, in his latter period, not his former period, of course. Uh, and so we very much support this nomination. And it was really disappointing when he wasn't able to stand for re-election in 2017. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. There are no other councillors who have indicated that they wish to speak. So I'm going to ask you now to vote. Will you wiggle your mouse? And then you can see where the hand is. Ignore the hand and go to the right of the hand where it says show conversation, press on that icon. And you should have meeting chat recommendations there. But I pass over now to our teller, Kevin. Thank you, Chairman. I can see members are voting now. We'll give them a few seconds to cast their votes. Chairman, we have 55 so far in favour, none against and no abstains, so I think it's a clear majority. I'm going to declare that recommendation accepted by the Council to congratulate the new Alderman on his appointment. And with that, I will bring this meeting to a close. Um, we will then switch off the webcast and we will come live again few minutes before quarter past 11. I think that's correct. I'm getting nods all around.
Okay, I'm told that they're, they're on. Do I have any apologies for absence? Uh, we listed some earlier in the special meeting. There's no further apologies to announce, Count, uh, Chairman. Okay, members, the next item on the agenda is declarations of interest. I do not propose to read through the entire paragraph again because I have read through it once before a few minutes ago at the earlier meeting. I'm taking it as read unless any members object, but I do point out that members need to act in accordance with the code when it comes to declarations of interest. Item three, I propose that the minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of May, 2020, Accurate record. Any member not in agreement with the minutes which have already been published, please indicate now if they wish to speak. I have Councillor Harrison. No, Councillor Benison, I'm sorry. Councillor Benison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it says that the meeting was held at the castle. Um, in May, whereas it was a virtual meeting. Thank you. We can amend that to reflect that it is a virtual meeting based at the council. That'll satisfy Councillor Dennison. Councillor Collett. Thank you, Chairman. On page 10, minute 204, uh, the final paragraph there says that, um, well, it reflects the fact that I raised a question in relation to the deputation procedure, um, which wasn't proposing to allow deputations to be seen when they make their deputations. And I know the leader said that he would look into this request. As it happens, we don't have any deputations today, so it's not an issue today, although it could have been. Um, having looked into it myself, my understanding is there's no technical reason why this can't be done. Uh, it's just a choice that we need to make. And I would reiterate the point that I made before. That yes, if I'm you sorry are to interrupt you, but we're not here to debate whether that is a correct uh, procedure or not. We're here to debate whether the item as printed on the agenda is correct. Chair, Chairman, I appreciate that. It's a matter arising that I'm trying to raise. It says the leader agreed to look into this request with officers. Now, that is a great statement as far as I know, so we can accept the minutes. So, Chairman, can you guide me as to when we can raise that matter arising? I think you should, you should raise that with the leader. Which is what I'm doing. You can do it privately. You don't have to do it at this meeting because this is a minute approval it's not a discussion so when will the leader give us a response i think we can wait for the leader to speak later when the leader does speak on that item okay thank you very much rising at the council meeting we normally do matters arising through committees are there any other items on the uh, um, minutes that people wish to raise Good, and I will sign the minutes as a true record of that meeting. We move on to deputations. There are none. We come now to Chairman's report. Members, I, I regret to advise that since we last met, we have been advised of the deaths of a number of former member colleagues. And they are Frank Rust, who represented the Aldershot East Division from 2013 to 2017. Brian Palmer, who represented the Romsey Division from 1973 to 1977. Ray Cobbett, who represented the Emsworth and St. Faith's East Division from 1993 to 1997, and Alderman Philip Marydale, CBE, who represented the Battersea Division from 1973 to 1989. My sympathies on behalf of all of you, perhaps all of their families. 
In a moment, I shall ask all members to bow their heads and observe a short silence as a mark of respect to these former colleagues. But first, I understand that when a number of members wish to speak in remembrance of these colleagues, and I shall call these names, their names in turn. When you are called, please unmute your microphone, wait a second or two and then speak. Please remember to mute your microphone again when you're finished. When all those who have indicated have finished speaking, I shall ask if there are any other members who wish to speak. I shall then ask you to mute all microphones and bow your heads. A notice will appear on the outside viewer's screen in the podcast explaining what is happening at that time. After about 30 seconds, I shall then continue with my announcements. I shall call first of all Councillor Collett to speak in respect of two members, two former members, then Councillor Perry to speak in respect of two former members, then Councillor Carew, then Councillor McAvoy, then Councillor Cooper, then Councillor Chad, then Councillor Chowdhury, and then Councillor Huxley. So first of all, I may ask Councillor Collett to speak. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I knew at one time or another all four of the former members that uh, we're remembering today. I didn't really know Brian Palmer very well, and certainly not in the council chamber. Uh, I do recall Philip Merridale, who was chair of the Education Committee in the days when all members were involved in uh, decision making and policy formulation. And I know that he commanded a great deal of respect both across the council chamber and indeed nationally, where he led on a lot of education um, issues. And I'm, I'm sure that others who are about to speak will, will fill us in more on that. I knew Frank Rust better um, as someone who grew up in Aldershot. Frank Rust was a long established Aldershot name and I knew his name long before I knew him. Uh, he was very deeply rooted in the community and widely respected across the political spectrum. Uh, I don't think it was too surprising that he ended up as chair of the um, Hampshire Community Health Council. I don't think that was its proper name, but um, that's effectively what it did back in the 1990s. So when I heard that dreadful news two or three months ago uh, that he had fallen to COVID, um, I think I was perhaps as much shocked as anyone else to hear that. Um, in fact, he was the first person that I knew had fallen to COVID and sadly there have been others since. So Chairman, um, that is a great loss to Aldershot, I know that. I'm sure it's a great loss to the Labour Party and it's a great loss to us all to see Frank um, lose his life to COVID as he did two or three months ago. Chairman, I also knew Ray Cobbett very well I shared a few interesting things with Ray. Not only were our surnames very similar, uh, he had a double B where I had a double L, but we both lived at the same address. He lived at One Eastern Road, Havant, and I grew up at One Eastern Road, Aldershot, uh, which is um, just an interesting coincidence. But obviously my main connection with Ray was through the uh, Liberal Democrats and through his membership of the County Council from 1993 to 1997. But also we both joined Friends of the Earth uh, many years ago and I know this was an absolute passion for Ray uh, throughout his whole period of public involvement. He was deeply concerned about climate change and all the different things that contribute to climate change and the need for humanity to treat this issue seriously. And also issues such as species extinction, and again, all the things that we as humanity do that is driving that and making it happen. And of course, ultimately our own extinction if we don't treat these issues seriously. And I admire the way that right throughout his life, until the day he sadly died, he campaigned on these issues 
um, and did everything he could to, uh, to try and lead us to a sensible way forward. So, Chairman, um, those are my comments on the four members uh, who, or former members, who we've lost. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Collett. Call upon Councillor Perry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I wish to uh, pay my tribute uh, briefly but sincerely to all four uh, former councillors. The only one I actually served with uh, in the council chamber was Frank Rust, and I endorse the comments that uh, Adrian Count Councillor Collett has made about Frank Rust, uh, a thoroughly hardworking and conscientious councillor and a, a good man. Specifically, I wanted to pay tribute to Honorary Alderman Philip Merridale and Brian Palmer, who both at times represented parts of the division that I now represent of, of Romsey Rural. Uh, as far as uh, Philip Merridale is concerned, he was indeed one of the great men of Hampshire, uh, and certainly his term and time as chairman of the Education Committee uh, of the County Council set Hampshire's education on uh, particular lines, uh, it, it, specifically uh, the commitment to sixth form colleges, which was something that he endorsed. And I think many young people in Hampshire who've had the benefit of our great sixth form colleges may not know it, but they owe a lot to their success to the, the great work that Philip Merridale did. One anecdote I will give, I can remember on one election day, uh, as he and his wife were about to go off to the Count's uh, for, for the election, I said to his wife, Anne, and I have written to her, uh, it, it's awful when you go to a count, it's a bit like going to wait to get um, an examination result, to which she replied, far, far worse. When it's an examination result, you've done your own work and you've got your own fate in your own hands. When you go to get an election result, it's hundreds, thousands of other people who really don't necessarily take it quite as seriously as he do. But uh, certainly he was a great man. Brown Palmer, he and I may well have been of uh, different political persuasions, but he was a thoroughly conscientious councillor, a great servant of the town of Romsey and the area around. Uh, and I, I pay certainly great respect to, to Brian, Brown's work for the county council, but also for the, the whole area of Romsey. His daughter, to whom I wrote, uh, lives in France now, a little village called Eric in uh, Brittany. Uh, I often used to drive past that on the way to my own house. Uh, and Brian and I often used to joke about uh, uh, how great France is. And uh, I think at one time he tried to get uh, my village of Wello twinned with uh, the, the village where his daughters live. But certainly a good man, uh, and we shall miss the likes of him. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Carew. Councillor Carew. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Councillor Carew. Can you hear me now? You're fine, Councillor Carew. Please speak. Lovely. Thank you. Um, I refer to Ray Cobbett. Um, I didn't know Ray when he was a county councillor, um, but I did know Ray both as a Green campaigner and as a Liberal Democrat agent when I was national chair of the Green Liberal Democrats, which, for those who don't know, is a Green wing of that party. Of course, we both left the party out of frustration. Ray joined the Green Party, but I kept in touch. Ray was as radical as his famous namesake. I once asked him if he was descended from William Cobbett. He laughed, but said he did not know. Ray was a passionate climate change campaigner, and given the seriousness of climate crisis and species extinction, I feel that we are very much the poorer for his loss. I was very privileged to have known him. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Carew. Councillor McAvoy. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, I never knew Alderman Merridale, but his legacy is one that will never be forgotten by the tens of thousands of people who over the years have enjoyed Calshot and used the centre. 
The Cal Shot Spit is one of those few unique places where daily there is always something interesting happening. The many voluntary groups encourage members to enjoy water sports, indoor sports, angling, camping, and there are just people who just generally love cow shot. But in 1982, there was trouble on the horizon. The centre was failing and heading for closure. On Monday, the 26th of January, 1982, a petition with 7,000 signatures was presented to Councillor Philip Merrydale. The next day, a large crowd of Calshot supporters gathered outside the council chamber, handing out Save Our Centre leaflets to the councillors prior to the Education Committee meeting. Councillor Philip Merrydale was chairman of the Education Committee and had the foresight to recognise the value of both this dual in Solent and the supporters who loved the place. Even better, this duel was in the hands of Hampshire County Council, and he said, if the centre could be saved from closure, it would be saved. So he pulled the closure item from the agenda. Councillor Merrydale was quoted as saying, the centre's future depended on active support from regular users, and the committee had been impressed by the tremendous and spontaneous way, a spontaneous wave of support for the centre. He suggested that a Calshot association would be able to advise staff and create a partnership between the users and the county council. And he went on to emphasise that the centre should be opened up to the residents of the whole county. On the 24th of July, 1984, the Further Education Subcommittee approved the constitution of the Calshot Activity Centre Association. This voluntary organisation would comprise representatives from the clubs and users with the association charging a membership fee and making donations towards the centre's projects. The centre would now be saved. Thanks to Alderman Merrydale and his blue sky thinking, he was clearly ahead of his time. In the intervening years, the valuable bond between the centre and supporters has been stretched and forgotten, with several clubs relocating their base. What has not been forgotten, however, is the gratitude and appreciation that the volunteers of Calshot Association and the voluntary user groups have for Alderman Merrydale and all that he did for Calshot. I believe that this is a wonderful legacy for his family. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McAvoy. Councillor Cooper. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Brian Palmer uh, served as Romsey Town's Hampshire County Councillor between 1973 and 1977, as you said earlier. Brian was a Hampshire man uh, through and through, uh, and he was born, in fact, in Sandleheath, uh, near Fordingbridge, in fact, on the Hampshire border uh, in 1929. Uh, one of his early claims to fame was he went to uh, Bishop Wordsworth School in Salisbury, where he was taught by William Golding, uh, the author of Lord of the Flies. Uh, he was actually his English teacher, and I wonder which of the boys Brian actually was. Uh, aged 18, Brian volunteered for the Royal Air Force, and among other postings, he served in, in Libya. Uh, he married in 53 uh, and left the Air Force in 54 and took an engineering course at uh, University of Southampton. And he graduated to go and work at IBM in Hursley, um, that great centre of, of, of research. Uh, in 1964, Brian and Pam came to live in Romsey, where they brought up their family. As a county councillor from 1973, Brian was well in advance of his time. Uh, saying many wise things about the environment and being very critical of the policy that buried our rubbish uh, in landfill. In 1974, he was the founder member of the Romsey and District Society. Uh, that society was set up to campaign for the preservation of the character of Romsey, uh, and the campaign, led by Brian and others, helped persuade uh, Hampshire County Council to draft the excellent Romsey Conservation Study which was published in 1979. So well done, Hampshire County Council. Because from that point on, Romsey's character, medieval street pattern, 
and its ancient buildings were all secured by the planning system. In addition to his role at the county, uh, Brian served as Town Mayor Romsey in 76-77, a Borough Mayor of Chess Valley in 96-97, and was a Borough and Town Councillor for the Romsey Cupin Award between 79 and 83, and 87 and 2003. In the joint administration in 1995, Brian was the Chairman of the Southern Planning Committee, and he served with absolute distinction in that role between 1995 and 1998. Uh, Brian was always kind to his colleagues and to me especially. Uh, during this time, I was the group and council leader and Brian was one of a triumvirate of senior councillors who willingly took the weight off my shoulders. And that's the kind of man Brian was. And we shared many a pint uh, on the way home from meetings in Andover. On, on more than one occasion, he told me he was originally motivated to stand uh, for election uh, to the council as it was full of boring old farts. In 2003, he freely confessed that he had become one and chose to stand down. Well done, Brian, and thank you, Brian. Thank you, Councillor Pugh. Councillor Chair. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to say a few words about um, Frank Rust, if it's okay. Um, I had the privilege of serving on the County Council with Frank between 2013 and 2017. And as others have said, he was yeah, a hardworking, genuinely really lovely, lovely person, Frank was, who will be greatly missed by Aldershot and everyone at Rushmore. I loved hearing his stories of his um, town twinning trips to Alborossel and Moudon, which Rushmore were twinned with. And we have lost a really, really fantastic local councillor in Rushmore. Thank you, Chairman, for letting me speak. Thank you, Councillor Chair. Councillor Chowdhury. Um, thank you, Chairman. I wish to um, pay a tribute to our dedicated colleague, Frank Rust, who was a truly outstanding councillor and a great man, who cared passionately about the community he was clearly proud to serve. Frank had a rare quality of absolute integrity and he was one of the most honest men I know, have known. Frank and I, he stood uh, from the Liberal Party in 1987 and we were standing on the polling station and was, we were joking with each other and he said to me, Charles, I hope you win this election. And I did. In the evening when we started to count the vote, I won with the handsome majority. He came to me and shook the hand. And he's, he, he's, he was a guy who was a friendly to everybody and he had a passion for the people and the community. And uh, Frank uh, and I uh, served in the Russian Bar Council for many, many years with council for 24 years. We sat on the town training committee, we sat on the Russian in Bloom, and we always shared our views and talk about. I always invited him, I said to him, Frank, why did you come and join the Conservative Party? You seem to be a conservative man. But he's always smiled uh, whenever you asked him anything. Frank um, was elected to be the uh, mayor of Rushmore this year and I was to be his deputy. Unfortunately, uh, he passed and it's a great loss to the uh, local community and uh, I feel sorry for the family and the, his friends. That is a great loss to our community. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Chaudhry. Councillor Huxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I only knew Councillor Frank Ross through his service uh, on the Health and Adult Social Care Select Committee. He was very knowledgeable on matters health and social. His contributions were always thoughtful, incisive and relevant. What is more, he was a gentleman, always polite and courteous at all times, respectful and respected. His civic contributions will be sorely missed, not just in this forum, but also in Aldershot and Rushmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Axted. And Councillor Warwick. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to briefly um, pay tribute to Councillor Rust. Frank and I served on the Hampshire Police and Crime Panel together. 
In fact, we attended a panel meeting um, only a few weeks before his death and just days before lockdown. Um, and as we left the meeting, we chatted about COVID and the pandemic and its likely impact. And as we left, we normally would shake hands or even give each other a hug. And we kind of awkwardly said farewell by bumping elbows and doing that sort of COVID dance. Frank had served on the police and crime panel since October 2016, and it, it was great because that panel, as members will know, is relatively apolitical. Frank sat on the complaints, the panel working group, and he took a lead on diversity and inclusion. So panel members will miss Frank's valued contributions, and I will miss his very dapper dress sense. He'll be sadly missed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Lloyd. Councillor Joy. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I, I'm to say a very brief comment about Councillor Frank Rust. It was desperately sad news to hear the tragic loss uh, earlier this year. I served uh, for a while with uh, Frank on the member development group where he always made a very constructive contribution. But in brief, he and I echo what has been said by so many others, he was an absolute gentleman, always engaging and a wise counsel. And he's left an indelible mark, certainly on my memory. Rest in peace, good friend. Thank you, Councillor Joy. Are there any other members who wish to speak? Right, then what I'm going to ask you all to do is to mute your microphones and quite clearly bow your heads for about 30 seconds before I continue with announcements. Thank you. Thank you, members, for participating in that mark of respect to our four former councillor colleagues. I shall now continue with my announcements. Now, very brief. <coughs> Excuse me. Since we last met, Hampshire County Council's property services have been shortlisted for another award. Uh, for 50 years, the Royal Institute of Architects awards and prizes for buildings have championed and celebrated the best architecture in the United Kingdom, no matter what the form, size, or budget. I'm pleased to announce that the new Oakmore School in Whitehill and Borden has been shortlisted this year for Riders South Awards 2020. The school has been designed and delivered by Hampshire County Council's property services team. The team have a national reputation for the design of our schools in Hampshire, and this school is the latest project to receive the recognition from RIDA. Hampshire County Council were the clients for the new school. There have been significant funding contributions from the Department of Education, the Defence Infrastructure Organisation, and the County Council also worked closely with the University of Chichester, the Academy Trust, East Hampshire District Council, and the White Hill and Borden Regeneration Company on the delivery of the new school, and our thanks to all of them. I would end on a personal note, but say that I'm also particularly pleased to see energy efficiency and consideration of climate change included in the design. And I'm sure that this new school will provide excellent education facilities for the current and future generations of children in Whitehill and Borden. And finally, on behalf of all members, I should like to thank the Chief Executive and his entire team for the sterling work they are doing at present in the face of very difficult circumstances to keep our services to the public of Hampshire going so well. Thank you indeed.
We move now to item six, which is the leader's report. And I'd ask Councillor Mayers to give us and present his report now, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. First of all, I'd like to associate myself with all the remarks that have been made about our, our colleagues, our former colleagues that have passed on. I knew Frank Russ, and I met many years ago Philip Merrigay. And indeed, he began to change my view on grammar schools. And indeed, I think his legacy will be the excellent six form colleges that exist in our county. Chairman, councillors, at the start of the pandemic, I made it clear that the main objective for us was to reduce the spread of the virus. To work together to do this and to look after each other. I would like to thank the Chief Executive, all his officers and indeed everyone who works for the County Council for all the hard work they have carried out in difficult circumstances during the crisis. In addition, my thanks to those outside the County Council who have worked with us to fight the virus. In particular, I want to commend all those voluntary groups and those communities who've done so much without specifically being told to look after the vulnerable and the elderly. We as a county have certainly worked together and we as a county have looked after each other. Sadly, despite all our efforts, so far there have been over a thousand deaths in Hampshire connected to COVID-19, of which over 400 have been in care homes. We've done our best to help care homes by passing on the finance provided by the government for them, even before we actually received the first instalment ourselves. This despite the fact that our finances have been significantly stretched by the pandemic, as is clear from the financial report before you later on the agenda. Now, we are moving into the recovery phase. The objective remains the same, to control the spread of the virus. But now we must focus on containing local outbreaks and preventing them from spreading. The first meeting of the local outbreak engagement board took place on Tuesday under my chairmanship to assist with this. And I'd like to thank Councillor Keith House for agreeing to sit on this board. We must also do everything we can to assist the economic recovery. And we have expanded our subcommittee that reports directly to the cabinet to do this on the subject of economic recovery by inviting the Right Honourable Maurice Miller, MP for Basingstoke to join the committee. I'm delighted to tell the council that she's agreed to do so. Finally, I would like to say a word about Black Lives Matter. Like you and many other Hampshire residents, I was appalled by the death of George Floyd in the United States. This is an event that affects us all in the same way that racism does and is causing all of us to reflect on what more can be done to combat hate and ensure quality of opportunity for all. I'm expre extremely proud of the vibrancy and the diversity of Hampshire communities and the County Council's track record in commitment to reducing inequality and advancing inclusion and cohesion. In recent years, we've significantly repressed our equality objectives and strengthened our arrangements 
to prevent and tackle all forms of discrimination and hate crime, especially through our inclusion and diversity strategy and action plan. I, committed, I, I, I have been in regular discussion with the chief executive on these issues and strongly support his and the CMT's commitment to further progress those plans in partnership with BAME, the, 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 the staff network. We have worked hard on these issues, but no one should doubt that more can and will be done. Chairman, that completes my report as leader. Thank you, leader. Thank you, Councillor Morris. We move on now to item seven, which is questions to the various earlier holders. Maximum time of 30 minutes is allowed for questions. The first one is from Councillor Briggs. If you would please read your question so that everyone out there on the ether can hear it. Thank you, Chairman. Would the Executive Lead Member clarify what measures were and are being taken to safeguard Hampshire's children during this COVID-19 period? Councillor Stellard. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and also um, good morning, members. Um, I'd like to start off by, by thanking Councillor uh, Briggs for raising this very important question. And I am pleased to advise members that throughout the last three months of COVID restrictions in children's services, it has been very much business as usual although perhaps doing it somewhat differently. All of our vulnerable children have been seen in accordance with statutory requirements. All of the meetings to progress their plans and keep children safe have been maintained in line with regulations. Children have continued to come into care and to a lesser degree to leave care but only where it has been safe and appropriate to do so. This has been achieved in the main through the use of virtual visits using technology, including apps and FaceTime calls, which allow our social workers to see and speak to children and families. Where urgent child protection concerns have arisen, then our social workers have safely undertaken direct face-to-face -face visits to ensure that children are protected. All cases have been responded to and no child has been left at risk. And this is despite an increase in the number of referrals going through the multi-agency multi safeguarding hub. Our foster carers have continued to care for children and they have accepted new places. In some cases, those placements have been uh, with children who have come from families where there have already been cases of COVID-19. Such is the dedication of our foster carers. Our children's homes have remained staffed and operational, ensuring that children in care continue to receive the highest levels of care and support that they need. Indeed, some of our children's care home staff have stayed in the care homes, isolating themselves from their own families to ensure that they do not put any of the, our Hampshire children at risk. Children's services have worked closely with all our schools, contacting them on a daily basis to ensure as many vulnerable children as possible attend. Where, for whatever reason, a vulnerable child does not attend school, risk assessments have been put in place to support them and social worker contact is maintained with more face-to-face -face visits, but only where it is safe to do so. I am sure members will join with me in thanking our children's social workers our foster carers and our residential workers for their continuing efforts in such very, very difficult circumstances. 
and with apologies for the interruption. Um, thank you, Councillor Stowell. Councillor Briggs, do you have a supplementary question? No, I don't. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. That was the Executive Lead Member for Children's Services and Young People, Councillor Stella. Thank you for that, Councillor Stella. Um, Councillor Peter Latham has a question to be answered by the Executive Member for Commercial Strategy, Human Resources and Performance. So first of all, Councillor Peter Latham. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question is, uh, in the light of the COVID-19 lockdown, and the current position regarding the council finances as set out in the latest cabinet report, I think dated the 1st of July. Has there been any government grant, new government grant announcement, which could substantially change or improve our overall financial position? Thank you. Um, executive member, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to Councillor Latham for the question. Uh, the simple answer is no, there has not been an announcement that would substantially change or improve our overall financial position. In fact, since the report was produced, the government announced a further package of measures on the 2nd of July to help local government deal with the financial impact of COVID-19 and the director provided a briefing note on the day setting out the potential impact for Hampshire County Council. Uh, we're still awaiting further details of exactly what we might get through that, but it's clear given the size of the overall package that the additional funding will not substantially change or improve our overall financial position. Um, the best case estimate that the director has made is that we could get 12 million pounds and a, a worst case would be about seven and a half million of one-off funding and whilst we would welcome getting that it pales into insignificance against the almost 110 million pounds of unplanned costs and losses this financial year resulting directly from the impact of covid thank you councillor e councillor latham do you have a supplementary question uh, no i don't i was anticipating this that answer. The question was made a week or so ago, and I was just hoping there might have been something between now uh, and then, but no, no supplemental. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fran Carpenter, your question. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, would the Executive Member, Councillor Chad, for our education, agree with me that the musical activities and achievements of Hampshire Music Service staff and youngsters have been exceptional during the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you. Um, the Executive Member for Education and Skills is Councillor Chaired. Would you like to respond, please? Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Carpenter, for this question. Um, yes, I would definitely agree with you. Um, whilst some music services followed their staff in Hampshire, we actually decided to face the challenge of lockdown head on and continue to offer a wide range of musical opportunities for pupils still in school and those at home. This has included real-time online instrumental voice lessons for 2,750 pupils per week using Google Meet, weekly curriculum support for secondary, primary and special schools with lots of practical activities for pupils to do at home. Many in isolation video performances I will ask officers to circulate the most recent one of the 237 children performing This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. It is really, really fantastic. One of our masked video items, a special happy birthday message to Captain Tom, was actually picked up by BBC online newsfeed and gained 16,464 views on YouTube, our highest performing post ever. Yeah. We've had Friday, sorry, we've had Friday recitals streamed on Facebook where ensembles members could show off their talents as soloists and virtual ensemble rehearsals and a chance for children to meet up with their friends again to perform together. Feedback from schools and parents has been very positive indeed and whilst we've been very, it's been a very busy term, it's definitely been worthwhile. We hope to be back in school in September so we can resume making music together as soon as possible. Thank you, Councillor Chair. Councillor Cooper, your question. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we all recognise the importance of Hampshire's economic recovery after the COVID-19 lockdown. But how do we align this recovery with our climate change and transport strategies in a sustainable way? Thank you. Uh, the executive member for Economy, Transport and Environment is Councillor Humby, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. So I'll refer your question to the leader. Councillor Manns. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Councillor Cooper, for this question, which I will answer on behalf of the deputy leader. Green recovery is gaining significant traction. And in Hampshire, we've taken the decision to embed climate change and sustainability into the COVID-19 recovery process. To support this, we are hosting a Hampshire 2050 partnership event on July the 21st to explore options and maximise recovery as a catalyst for change by considering how the rebuild process could be constructed to create a more sustainable, low carbon and resilient response. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, supplementary, if I may, please. Yes, certainly. Uh, in my own division, I'm involved in a very positive discussions about the county's first fully electric bus service linking Farnborough with Fleet using S106 development funds. Would the executive member be supportive of this sort of initiative? I think the best way I can answer that question, Councillor Cooper, is to say that I will encourage him to do so. I think this is an excellent uh, uh, example of the way ahead. And I will certainly be in touch with uh, 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 the deputy leader as soon as I see it. I will be in touch with him very shortly to make that point to him. Yes, thank you for that, because we are, of course, very pleased to see that anything which makes Hampshire greener and cleaner uh, is promoted during my year. If I could just go back to Councillor um, Carpenter for a moment, I erroneously forgot to ask her if she had any supplementary questions for Councillor Chair. Um, that's fine, I'll leave my question till after the meeting, thank you. Thank you Councillor Carpenter, my apologies. So we move on to the next question, which is from Councillor Chowdhury. Councillor Chowdhury, are you there? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While it seems we are now past the peak of the virus in care homes, families will be concerned that the death from the COVID-19 continue to be higher in these settings. Could the executive members update the members on the number of deaths in the care homes setting in our county? Whether this is declining or what support is being offered to the care homes to ensure they are following the correct procedure and the measures to reduce any suffering to those who loved one reside in our care homes and to already bereaved families. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The executive member for adult social care and health is Councillor Fairhurst, and I would ask her to respond. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. My... You're, you're live. I'm all right now, am I? Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Chowdhury, for your question. First of all, could I record my thanks to the way in which care homes and indeed the whole care sector has acted with humanity, compassion, and adherence to the highest standards throughout this pandemic. Now across the County of Hampshire, there are almost 500 care homes with more than 13,000 beds registered with the Care Quality Commission. Between the 28th of April and up to the 7th of July, there have been 1,775 recorded deaths across all care home settings. Of these, some 769 are considered to be excess deaths. That is, the number of above average deaths seen in the three over the three preceding years. And of these, 456 people have had COVID-19 recorded on their death certificate. Thankfully, since a peak in deaths in the middle of April, 
we have seen a continued and steady decline in deaths in care home settings. In the last week when figures were available, there was just one death recorded with COVID-19 identified. The overall number of deaths is also now lower than the average number seen in the pre previous three years. The care home sector is being proactively supported by Hampshire County Council, working with NHS partners, the Hampshire Care Association, and supported by Health Watch Hampshire and the Care Quality Commission. A comprehensive action plan has been published on the Hampshire County Council website, outlining support to the sector, which includes all aspects of care provision, clinical and medical support, and access to emergency PPE. Furthermore, as the, as the leader alluded to, I am pleased to confirm that Hampshire County Council has allocated and paid almost £18 million in infection prevention and control grants, funding being received from the government, of which care homes have directly received almost £15 million through two payments, one made in late May and again in early July. Hampshire County Council has acted to make this money available to the sector in advance of receiving it from the government. And this funding is in, is in addition to some 15 million that the care sector will receive from Hampshire County Council between April and September in additional commissioned care payments to support their activity and try to limit the impact of the pandemic. A comprehensive range of further support to care homes is also being provided through the local outbreak management plan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, do you have a, a supplementary question, Councillor Chaudhry? Um, just, um, Chairman, I've got no supplementary, but I would like to thank you for your answer. Can I ask you to pass our thanks to all those who work in the care homes for their efforts over the last three months. Can you, Councillor, pass our uh, message to the care homes workers? Thank you very much. Happy to do so, Councillor Chowdhury. Councillor Fairhurst, that was a very comprehensive answer with a number of numbers and figures and answer funny. May I ask you please to circulate that answer to all members in an email after the meeting? Happy to do so, Chairman. Thank you very much. So, uh, Councillor Jackie Porter, your question, please. Thank you. Uh, and I gather I'm putting it to the leader rather than the executive member uh, because for transport and environment because he's not able to attend the meeting. Thank so, you, Councillor Porter. I'm quite capable of chairing the meeting. Just thank you. OK, thank you. If the County Council is serious about cycling and walking throughout the county, will the executive member commit to ensuring that when ro that roads are fit for purpose for cyclists too, roads in the Itchen Valley Division are pocked with holes and trenches left by services repairs and poor workmanship. How often are underground works repairs carried out, checked for quality, and the services companies are not challenged to make good or pay so that the county can do the work instead? So, Councillor Humby is the Executive Member for Economy, Transport and Environment, but as I said earlier, he unfortunately can't deal with us. So I'm passing this question to the Leader. You're muted, Leader. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank Councillor Porter for her question to the Deputy Leader. As I say, I'm answering it on his behalf. When statutory undertakers, i.e. utility companies, undertake any work on the public highway, they are governed by the provisions of the New Roads and Street Works Act 1991. This primary legislation includes an obligation to reinstate excavations, i.e. trenches, to a minimum quality standard, and these have to be guaranteed for at least two years. Where contraventions are identified by the Highways Authority within the guaranteed period, either through sample inspection or from receiving reports, the relevant utility company is required by law to remedy defects at its own cost within a defined timescale. 
beyond the guarantee period, the responsibility and liability for repaired areas reverts to the County Council. The County Council has always maintained a robust approach to the enforcement of utility works, either through the issuing of fixed penalty notices or where appropriate and justified prosecution through the courts. British Telecom was successfully prosecuted in 2017 for serious compliance failures. Thank you. Councillor Porter, do you have a supplementary question? Yes, thank you for that answer, Anita. I appreciate it. But I would like to know which officers are responsible for the approval of those closure of the roads after the utility works and rechecking at the end of the guarantee period. And what is the budget for this work? I think that those, um, those officers' names need not be disclosed to you in, in terms of this public meeting. Uh, but I would ask that if the chief executive is happy for you to have those names, they will be sent to you in an email. Thank you. All the titles and the titles of those offices will be relevant, I think. Thank you. OK. Um, do you wish to add anything to that answer, uh, Councillor Mann's leader? No, no, uh, Chairman, I think you, you, you've said it all. Thank you. Um, move on then to Councillor Todd. <coughs> um, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, would the leader advise whether he, any of his cabinet or any officers have met any other bodies to discuss the possibility of devolution, unitary status or other local government reorganisation? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Todd, for that uh, question. Um, before I answer it, with your indulgence and that of the chairman, I'd like to just quickly remark on the oral question produced by your colleague, Councillor Collett, earlier this uh, earlier today. And in answer to his question, yes, we are looking seriously in ensuring that future delegations can be seen as well as heard. Turning, you, to, your, <laughs> turning to your substantive question, Councillor Todd, the answer is simply yes. I've attended personally a number of meetings of the uh, uh, County Council network, the uh, various other groups of leaders right across the southeast and indeed right across the country, and indeed webinars with various ministers. And I cannot think of one occasion where at least one of the items you mentioned wasn't discussed. And I'm sure that is a very similar situation when it comes to the officers when they see other uh, council officers across the country. I can't give you a complete list of how many times my cabinet colleagues have done the same, but you would not be surprised to know that with the issues going through government at the moment, and I'm thinking particularly of the white paper on devolution that is due to come out in September, the issues you mentioned are very com are current and being discussed by many people. Thank you. Councillor Todd, do you have a supplementary question? Um, yes, could he tell us more about the rumoured plans and what he thinks of them? And, and would the leader agree that aside from the risk of a serious dilution of local accountability, all this talk of reorganisation feels like a cynical diversion from the very real challenges faced by local government, and in particular, the complete failure of central government to adequately fund the extra costs incurred by local government during the COVID crisis. I can't comment on rumours. I don't think it's a cynical diversion, but I do agree with him that we could do with more money from central government. I think we should all wait for the white paper before actually commenting. I don't think I'd want to comment much further than that until we see the contents of the white paper or any announcements beforehand that may or may not be made by ministers. Thank you. Um, Councillor Todd, you have tabled a f another question on a slightly different matter. Would you like to put that question? Uh, I've actually tabled a further two, but I'm happy to ask uh, my... Take my... them as they come. <laughs> Um, so Your this question. is a question to uh, the executive member for economy, transport and environment. 
what is the executive member for economy, transport and environment's ambition for social distancing measures on the streets of Hampshire's city, towns and villages? The leader will answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Todd, for that uh, further question on a different subject. And I'm answering it on behalf of my deputy leader. A range of temporary changes are being made across the county to provide more road space for people walking and cycling, keeping a safe social distance as they begin to go back to work and school after the, COVID, COVID, uh, the coronavirus lockdown. Further schemes are in development to support retail spaces, which mean traffic and taking tra traffic and parking out of our town centres to create space. These plans are being developed with Hampshire's district and borough councils, business improvement districts, town and parish councils and other organisations who have expressed an interest. I think one of the outcomes of the pandemic will, will mean that we're going to have to really look carefully at the priorities we have for transport across the county. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Todd? Yeah, indeed, I, indeed I Chairman. Uh, although I would like to welcome um, the leader's intention um, to revisit our, our priorities as a consequence of COVID-19. Would he describe uh, that ambition as an inspiring and challenging ambition? Does he think it measures up to the challenges of COVID-19, but also of the climate emergency, which I know he believes we need to urgently address? And is there enough urgency in implementing the changes we need? Because I've noticed that some very simple changes do seem to take a long time to be implemented. Yes, I think it does. But he will know as well as the, uh, uh, many other people that when you, input, when you try to make a change that you think is appropriate and is in line with the climate change uh, our aims we have, and indeed with those of many local people, Inevitably, there are other local people who think otherwise, and therefore it's important that we move forward to try to take as many people with us when we look at these changes that he mentions. And that's one of the reasons why perhaps he feels there are delays. I would say it's more a matter of reaching some form of consensus and consulting people. Thank you. So if we're quick, we might get the last two questions in. So firstly, Councillor Porter, or further questions? Thank you. Um, my question is, does the County Council have a plan or even any clue about how it's going to deliver an effective system of school transport for secondary school children in the autumn without risk to the children's health, their independence, the likely congestion and poor air quality if parents transport instead, and the impact on this already massive budget. Thank you. The Executive Member for Education and Skills, Councillor Chad. Thank you, Chairman. I'm actually going to have to hand this one over to my colleague, the Executive Lead Member for Children's Services and Young People, as it falls under her portfolio. So I'll Thank hand you. over to Councillor Stallard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble with my computer, so um, I don't know if you can see and hear me all right. Thank you, Hansel. Right, thank you. Um, I'd just like to report in, in reply to the question from Councillor Porter that Children's Services are indeed working very hard to organise an effective home to school transport service for September, but they are still awaiting detailed government guidance in relation to this area, and that will further influence their and our planning. The details provided by government so far indicate um, that there will be no requirement, no requirement to socially distance on dedicated home to school transport from the beginning of the autumn term. And this will increase the capacity on vehicles. The challenge for the home to school transport service will be supporting schools with phased start stroke finish times and minimising contact between different bubbles of pupils. We are working with all schools to understand their plans for managing groups of children from September and to agree an appropriate way 
of mitigating the contact risks as best we can through working measures such as seating plans, key stage groupings where possible, and hygiene measures upon arrival at school. Close working between the home to school transport service, schools, passenger transport and transport infrastructure teams will enable us to understand collectively the impact of measures such as increased number of cars at the school gate and congestion and mitigate wherever we can. However, there is no doubt that this is a highly complex piece of work coordinating over 700 educational establishments, over 1,000 different routes, over 10,000 children utilising our contracted home to school transport, plus children who use public transport as a means to getting to school or college. So this is a mammoth undertaking. But as I said at the beginning of my response, we are still awaiting guidance from central government on this uh, on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Porter, do you have a supplementary question? Yes, please. Um, will the executive member agree with me that the government's failure to support the councils and the schools with clear guidance before the schools close next week is actually a very, very disappointing action on the part of the government? Uh, well, I know the schools are planning and they have made some plans, but those plans, of course, as you point, quite rightly pointed out, may well be subject to change. Um, it is disappointing from a number of reasons, because I'm sure the schools would have wanted to have got this sorted out before the break at the end of this school term. And, and I'm sure the parents want clarity, as indeed do we. But we are hopeful of getting a, a response very soon from central government. Thank you. We've gone over this, just over the 30 minutes, but I thought members would want to hear that question and answer. Uh, the third question from Councillor Todd will be answered in writing within six working days, and will the meeting uh, and uh, the will be circulated to all members of this meeting. Turn now to item eight on the agenda, part one: matters for decision. Under item eight, under appointments. Would the leader please introduce the report? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, you have the appointments in front of you. They are fairly simple ones, and I would just ask the Council to approve the recommendation that these be made. We need to vote, so if I could ask you to go through the voting procedure. Thank you. I have more than 50% of members voting for the recommendation. That recommendation is therefore carried. We move on to item nine, which is the end of year financial report. Uh, the leader will introduce this report and the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you have the end of the last financial, the last year's financial report in front of you, and you will note the fact that we came in slightly under budget, which gave us a bit of extra funding to put into the budget bridging reserve. I think what this demonstrates is that up to the time that the pandemic hit us, the council was actually running on budget and on time for the savings. And therefore, I commend the recommendations specifically made at the end of the short note that this report on the council, county council's treasury management activities and prudent indicators set out in appendix two are approved. Um, and I now like to hand over to my 
cabinet colleague, Councillor Steve Reid, to give you a bit more detail on this item and also on the following item when we look at the medium term financial strategy. For the benefit of anyone watching the meeting, uh, Councillor Reid is the Executive Member for Commercial Strategy, Human Resources and Performance. Councillor Reid. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. And as the leader has indicated, I'll introduce this report and the next one, the medium term financial strategy together, uh, because they help to illustrate what has been happening and together they, they paint a picture. Uh, as members will see, and the leader has already referred, the outturn for last year was exactly on budget, actually seven, seven million pounds on the right side. But in the scheme of things, that's as near as maybe to spot on. Uh, in the context of having taken £140 million out of the budget in that year. The story up to that point was that the funding regime required us each year to find at least £50 million, and we had instituted a series of two-year programmes of efficiency and productivity improvements to help us direct more resources into the key areas of adult social care and children's services. And going forward, we know that we need to find at least £80 million every two years. At the same time, we carefully husbanded our reserves and our allocations for capital spending, giving us what the director often referred to as firepower to enable us to pay for important initiatives and funds to draw on if there were difficulties. And my goodness, there are difficulties. That said, the Director of Corporate Resources told us that this could not go on forever. Each two-year cycle was more difficult than the previous one, and in the medium term, something would have to give. But nobody foresaw as great an economic shutdown, uh, as great a difficulty as the economic shutdown caused by the COVID pandemic, and that's where we're living at the moment. Basically, we may have to draw on all our reserve funds to make sure that we continue to provide the services needed during the time of crisis. And in some cases, we have used those reserves already to pay out money before we received it to enable our partners to continue providing services. The unfunded costs and losses at the moment stand in round figures at £100 million and rising. And that is after receiving a share of two £1.6 billion tranches of cash made available by the government. At the beginning of the crisis, the government told us to spend what was necessary and they would reimburse us. And the simple truth is that we need them to make good on that promise. We also need them to recognise that some of our need arises from loss of operational income. I specify operational income to differentiate operational income from investment income. So, for example, closing a car park at a country park loses us money in terms of income not received. It is also a fact that the crisis has stopped us from pursuing the savings that we intended to achieve this year, setting back our two-year progress towards productivity improvements. So, as of now, we have to plan to deploy all our buffers and we anxiously await announcements from the government as to how they will fund us back to a position of sustainability. Quite rightly, the director and her team have examined scenarios and they're laid out in the report. They paint a difficult picture and I think the table at paragraph 22 refers to this and adequately illustrates the difficult situation. The government quite rightly made some hugely difficult lockdown decisions to protect the residents of this country and the National Health Service. And Hampshire County Council has stepped up to the mark to help deliver on those difficult decisions. But in doing that, we've weakened our financial position. COVID will likely use up all our buffer funds and the medium term financial projections as laid out in this report are at the moment uncertain. We now need the government to offer full funding for the unavoidable expenditure and losses of income that its decisions are thrust upon us, otherwise we may not be viable. But as of Thursday the 16th of July, today, that announcement has not yet been made. Um, Mr Chairman, this is a dynamic situation and nothing better illustrates the pressure under which our staff have been working than the header to the report in red, 
that says information correct as of 1st of July. Uh, I know that the staff have worked extremely hard uh, to get the information to us, but I'm also very confident in the accuracy of that information and our ability to make decisions on it. If we do get more information, the director will ensure that members are informed as announcements uh, come in. And in the meantime, I commend the recommendations before us today. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you. I'm still actually dealing uh, with the uh, end of year financial report. Uh, is that where you're addressing your question, Councillor Porter? It is. It is, yeah. Councillor Candle, Chairman. Would you like well, to? May I take it? Um, in paragraph 2.3 of the council paper, and I think it's in 1.3 of the cabinet paper and then 3.1 of the council paper, it describes the variance in thousands. I think it should be in millions because otherwise the underspend by ETE would be 1.8 thousand. And in fact, it's um, the underspend is 1.8 million. Um, I just ask for that amendment to be made on the paper, if I, in fact I am correct. The, all of the other uh, section is in narrative rather than the that there is one more uh, table later on which is marked as in millions but in this particular one it's repeated several times in thousands it should be in millions. It, uh, Mr Chairman it sounds to me as if Councillor Porter is correct although I don't have the exact uh, paragraph number in front of me at the moment. Um, if she could repeat that I'll just look it up. It's uh, paragraph 2.3 in the council paper, 1.3 in the cabinet paper, and then it's been repeated again in 3.1 in the council paper. Well, 2.3 2 .3 in the council paper on page 18. Yes, the position for each of the departments is summarised in the table below. Yeah. And if you see, it says variance under or over budget in thousands. Yeah. So that, uh, that should yeah. be millions, I believe. Yeah. Um, you, Chairman, you it's John to, Coughlin here. Correct. I think Councillor, I think Councillor Porter is correct. I'm sorry yeah. about that, John Coughlin. Uh, and it's repeated several times during the paper, so I I suggest we amend that paper before we yes. agree it. We've all read what, uh, what 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 we thought was there, but strictly speaking, I think that is correct. Uh, and I'd like to thank Councillor Porter for bringing that matter to the council's attention. Luckily, the narrative is correct, so it doesn't affect the recommendation. Councillor Darden. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, may I just say before my question, um, I do share Councillor Reid's concerns about the lack of the uh, response from government in regards of where they promised the COVID-19, and it is a major concern, and I've had that concern for some time, as the leader is well aware. Um, can I ask a question on the page 29, Chairman, um, on the assurance statement, which obviously has to be signed by the Chief Executive and the Leader of the Council to be uh, carried out, the Chief Internal Auditor concluded in 7.2, in my opinion, Hampshire County Council's framework of governance, risk management and management control is adequate and audit testing has demonstrated controls to be working in practice. This is coming to my question, where weaknesses have been identified through internal audit review, we have worked with management to agree appropriate corrective actions and timescale for improvement. Can I ask, what were those weaknesses? Um, I think, um, if I can attempt to answer that, that those were issues that were, in, in any organisation, there is always room for uh, improvement. And if weaknesses are identified, then um, improvements get made. I don't believe that they have been sufficiently serious uh, for the officers to feel that they had to be brought before the members. So this is part of the um, normal procedure. But I can assure Councillor Dowden that all the issues that have been identified were reported to the audit committee and considered at that point. OK, thank you. Uh, I just I wanted to get that um, you know, clarified in my own mind. That's fine. Thank you. 
Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Dowden. If I might just, for the sake of completeness, mention to members that this is a particular paragraph which is used in every single audit report by every audit company throughout the UK whenever they find that they are comfortable. And it's partly to cover themselves so that uh, no one can say that they haven't identified any particular weakness uh, which subsequently emerges. So you will find that that is a standard paragraph and it, uh, it means exactly what it says. It doesn't point to any particular problem as far as I've been informed relating to the County Council's operations. Move on to Councillor Latham. Thank you, Chairman. I, I'd just like to comment on the end of year financial report because it is a significant document in terms of our financial position um, and it summarizes the fact that uh, we made savings of 7.2 million on our non-cash on our cash services expenditure and 11.9 million on our cash limited budget now in terms of the covid losses i accept that these are not massive sums but in their own right, they are significant sums, and I believe they are testimony in effect to the way we have run this council over the last 10 years. They are sums that we can use to go forward to help clear T19 and to help towards T21. So I think this report in itself underlines the strength of our overall financial position and enables us to consider and deliver T21 as soon as we can, understanding that that is, of course, going to be underpinned by departmental reserves and corporate financing. But I think this is a good and optimistic report. Thank you. Thank you. I do not see that any other members have indicated that they wish to speak. So I will return now to the leader for any concluding comments he wants to make before we vote. Uh, Chairman, I have no further comments apart from just agreeing with Councillor Latham that uh, this was an excellently uh, 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 excellent budget in the sense that the outturn was virtually identical to the budget itself except for a small in in terms of the size of the sums of money we're talking about a small surplus which of course has proved very helpful in subsequent uh, issues we have to do with COVID-19. Thank you so the recommendation for this uh, item is on page 16 could I ask members please to vote as to whether they approve the recommendation or otherwise? Thank you. I, I have more than well over half the members have voted in favour of the recommendation, so that recommendation is carried. Now, we need to vote separately um, on item 10, which is the medium term financial strategy, before we go to the recommendations. Um, I invite the leader just to summarise and add any comments that he wants. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, clearly, the pandemic has significantly affected our medium term financial strategy. I think I'd say at the outset that the caution that we've exhibited in terms of our investments and in terms of 
ensuring that our reserves are adequate to meet a rainy day have been very helpful in dealing with the, the pandemic. Nonetheless, as you will see from Para 14, we're over £100 million adrift on our budgeted figures before the pandemic took place. As Councillor Reid has pointed out, there's three areas. The first is the direct costs of the pandemic itself, which are significant and considerable. Secondly, the lost income from those activities that we derive income from, such as our parks. And thirdly, <clears throat> the loss of income from our investments, which is much smaller. And in addition, we still are not clear what effect the mm -hmm. huge reduction in GDP will have, an, uh, have on our ability to collect the estimated amount of revenue from council tax and from business rates. The government have certainly helped us, but as previous speakers have said, they haven't helped us enough. And I'm in contact with a number of other councils and indeed with ministers to explain exactly where we are and what we need in the future to ensure that we can balance our books in the long term. And that situation is indicated again in the papers in front of you and particularly the three scenarios outlined by the Treasurer. So I commend the, these, um, uh, the, these recommendations to the Council um, as an indication of where we stand regarding the medium term financial strategy. Thank you, sir. We are on item 10 and the matter is now open for debate. I have Councillor House. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I'd like to ask the leader a question. In fact, I'm going to ask him the same question that I asked him at uh, Cabinet on mm -hmm. Tuesday. Now, at that time, the leader said he couldn't give me a straight answer to the question. So I'm hoping after 48 hours, he now is able to give me a straight answer to the question. Because we have the most damning report probably that's ever been put in front of this council in terms of the way the Conservative Party has handled uh, the finances of local government. To the extent that we were told by the Chancellor and the Secretary of State at the beginning of the pandemic that we would spend whatever we needed to spend uh, and we would be given appropriate compensation and reimbursement. And yet we now find we're £103 million down. We have £120 million of new cuts. Three out of four scenarios that our Director of Resources describes to us give us a council that is not financially viable. And paragraph 51 of the Cabinet report says that we'll need to find another £200 million of savings over the next three years. So will the leader answer the question that I asked at Cabinet and give me a straight answer this time? What is the Conservative Party doing about local government finance and properly funding public services? Councillor Mans. I think the present government is doing a great deal. I think it needs to be taken into consideration the fact that this is an extremely unusual event that's occurred. And what I would say to him is if it wasn't for the good state of the government's finances up till now, we wouldn't have got as much help as we have. But I entirely agree with him. We do need more help. We need the government to recognise that in the 10 years since 2010, NHS funding has gone up by £30 billion. And in relation to that, local government expenditure has gone down by £20 billion. I do believe as a result of this crisis, the focus has been on local government, by government for the first time. And they're beginning to understand the work we do and the work we've done in relation to COVID-19. And I sincerely hope as a result of that, like him, that we will get more finance to meet the shortfall we have at the moment. And I would urge upon him, as I am doing with the government, I would urge upon him to impress that point 
to the leaders of his party to ensure that they put pressure on the government as well. Because at the end of the day, I do believe that the long term viability of local government is very important indeed. But I would finally add, there is no doubt that as a result of the, uh, the, the pandemic, as I say, there's more focus on what we do. And I'm pretty convinced that as a result of what's happened over the last couple of months, we will see at least a green, if not a white paper on the future of social security coming forward rather more quickly than it would otherwise have done. Are there any other members who wish to enter the debate? Then the leader has recommended those, has moved the recommendations A to C on page 66. So I'll now put those to the vote. I have 41 for, 13 against, the three abstentions. The recommendations are therefore carried. We move now to item 11, transport for the Southeast, TFSE, this report. And I'd ask the leader to introduce the report. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce this report because I attended the first meeting when this was discussed by the Southeast leaders. I think it's a very important uh, 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 body because once we approve these recommendations, which I hope we will, it will allow us to have a body to look at strategic transport infrastructure across the Southeast which will mirror what's already in existence in the Midlands and the North. And I hope as a result of that, that we'll get a better slice of the cake when it comes to government funding for the urgent transport and infrastructure needs that we, we, we must uh, ensure we have in the Southeast. So I recommend, I, 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 I hope the Council will approve the three recommendations at the end of this report. Thank you. Um, matters of questions or debate, I think we'll take them together. Councillor Todd. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have a, a question, which is uh, the um, uh, one item of this proposal I don't particularly like is that it shares the County Council's relatively low um, ambitions. Mm for timing in terms of achieving a zero carbon network. But I had a question relating to recommendation C, where it talks about adopting transport for Southeast transport strategy into the County Council's policy framework. Can the leader provide reassurance, actually tapping onto the comment that he made earlier, that this strategy will act as a floor to our ambitions, not a ceiling, um, and that we will uh, be seeking where necessary to be more ambitious than uh, in those areas that we control ourselves in terms of the transport strategies that we adopt? Yes. As you know, I genuinely believe in stretching but achievable targets. And I think he's providing the stretching. I will provide the achieving. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or members who wish to enter debate? on this item. 
Chancellor Porter. Thank you. Will the Transport for South East consider walking as one of the methods of transport? Um, it's certainly used by many people within urban areas and may well become more popular now they know they've got to get their hour of exercise. I wonder when you see papers written that always implies that you're on wheels of some form. Um, yes, you make a good point, Councillor Porter. I haven't been involved in the detailed discussions about exactly what transport in the South here, the transport strategy covers, um, as my colleague uh, Councillor Humby has been involved in those. However, I understand where she's coming from. And I think it's a jolly good idea that walking is included because it allows us to spend more money on footpaths, particularly footpaths in the county. So I see no reason why not, but I can't give her a guarantee that's in the strategy at the present time. Thank you. Councillor Simpson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is just to confirm I agree with the paper and I think it's a perfect example of power should be devolved down to the lowest possible level and government is clearly the wrong level for doing what we need to do on here. I, th I know we have representation on here in Councillor Humby that will help us on a strategic level to do so much more. Um, I just hope that we carry through this devolution of power downwards in all levels of the count councils, all councils, and don't go for the unitary. Thank you. I hear what Councillor Simpson says. <laughs> I have at this stage no other members who wish to enter the debate. Good, then I will move to the recommendations on page 126 which are recommendations A to C. Would you please vote on those recommendations, Member? Right, we have a clear majority, run against by the looks of it, so that is carried. And that ends our part one item. We've come now to put the part two items, and uh, these are matters of information. And firstly, a report from the Hampshire Fire and Rescue Authority, and also from the Shadow Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Fire and Rescue Authority, which you'll find on pages 295. Uh, and I will call upon the Chairman of the Authority uh, to speak on that. Yes, Chairman, uh, Councillor Carter, I, I am here. Can Good. everybody hear me? Thank you, Councillor Carter. Right, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, before I um, turn to the fire, authority. Can I apologise, Chairman, for an oversight on my part and return to item one on the agenda. Apologies. Um, I did have a note from Councillor Forster that he would be in France and attempting to join our meeting. Um, clearly, he hasn't been able to do so. So his apologies, I, sh I should have given apologies on his behalf. So that was Councillor Steve Forster. So, um, Turning to the fire authority, uh, Chairman, um, of course, it's over five months now since um, I've been able to address the Council on Fire Matters. Um, and um, with your permission, um, uh, Chairman, I'd just like to say a very few words. I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but uh, I will endeavour to be brief. Um, the fire authority, fire and rescue authority, in common with all authorities, 
um, had to comply with the Coronavirus Act earlier this year. And fire and rescue services across the land had an important role to play in the call for, to action to prevent the spread of the virus. The Chief Fire Officer for Hampshire, Neil Odin, uh, was appointed Chairman of the Strategic Coordinating Group, uh, which covers the whole of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, and that has been meeting in fire and police headquarters in Eastleigh. Um, it's very fortuitous that they have been um, rebuilt in the last, um, or, um, upgraded in the last um, uh, two years, and they were they are really fit for purpose um, for the for the coordinating group to be meeting there with um, uh, the, the, the military and, and all associated agencies. Um, many um, fire service employees have have been involved in supporting the SCG and its activities. And I can tell members that over 200 firefighters were involved in the building of the temporary mortuary. Um, that uh, wasn't necessarily used, but uh, at the beginning it looked as though it would be needed. Um, many firefighters have been crewing ambulances and also assisting the ambulance service in the, the important um, face fitting um, of masks that, that I hadn't realised until I... I read about it, how important it is for um, the ambulance service to have a mask that fits appropriately. And the firefighters have been um, generally supporting um, the, the logistics uh, across a whole range of activity um, that has um, uh, fallen upon the strategic coordinating group. So all that has been going on, um, but um, fires, there hasn't been so many road accidents. number of fires. Um, so there's been quite a lot of activity. And uh, the Deputy Chief Fire Officer, Steve Apter, has, has been leading um, what is termed the Emergency Management Team. Um, and, and with it, um, the Recovery Coordinating Group. Um, and I'd just like at this stage, Chairman, uh, on behalf of all the residents of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, um, to pay tribute to all the firefighters, um, in both in Hampshire and the island, who who've been working so diligently um, and uh, uh, professionally um, to make uh, life safe for all of us um, in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, and and supporting um, the um, efforts to deal with this virus. Um, perhaps also I should add that um, the strategic coordinating group um, has been scaled back. Um, it's still meeting, but it's been scaled back in recent times, um, but it stands ready to um, support um, the um, uh, local um, outbreak uh, engagement board if it is required to do so. So um, that was a, a brief statement on what has been happening in, in the last five months. Um, I turn now to um, the... Um, minutes of uh, the meetings. There are two sets of minutes. Um, 12B relates to Hampshire Fire and Rescue Authority. 12C relates to the very first meeting uh, of the shadow board of the Hampshire and um, Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Authority. Um, that first meeting just dealt with cons constitutional and governance arrangements. Um, Members, I have nothing further to add to those two sets of minutes, but um, I can take questions, obviously, if, if any arise. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Members, do you have any questions or comment on either 12B or 12C? I'll take them together. Right, in which case... We can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item 13. That's the annual report of the Policy and Resources Select Committees. Um, the Chairman of the Policy and Resources Select Committee itself is Councillor Glenn, so I'd ask him to present the report. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, can you all, can you hear me, Chairman? Perfectly. Good, okay. Um, I have great pleasure in submitting for your approval 
the 2019-2020 annual report of the Policy and Resources Select Committee. This incorporates the work of one, the Children's and Young People's Select Committee under the chairmanship of Councillor Kirsty North, two, the Culture and Communities Select Committee under the chairmanship of Councillor Anna McNair Scott, and thirdly, the Economy, Transport and Environment Select Committee under the chairmanship of Councillor Russell Oppenheimer. Sorry about the telephone. I would like to thank the uh, chairman and members of all three select committees for their diligent work. I'd also like to add a personal thanks to the members of the Policy and Resources Select Committee for the quality of debate over the year. Um, I actually do make a point of attending as many of the uh, select committees as I can. Now, sh should any member present have a question on the work of any specific select committee, I request that the uh, relevant chairman replies. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for that, Councillor Glenn. Members, do you have any questions on this paper? On the annual report? Right, then I will move on to the next item with my thanks to uh, all the uh, members of those select committees for the hard work that they do. So we come to Councillor Huxteth now for the next item on the agenda, which is agenda item 14. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, all the members of the Health and Social Care Select Committee for their work over the past year. Uh, and all the contributions they've made. Uh, the report is as is. Uh, you'll see from the upcoming topics, we still have a very uh, busy program ahead of us, and we're looking at ways in which we can uh, efficiently and effectively work through those items as quickly as we can. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all the officers and members uh, of Hampshire County Council who have contributed to uh, health and social care throughout the county through the COVID-19 epidemic. And also, of course, to thank because the uh, Health and Social Care Select Committee involves the NHS um, and uh, other uh, interested groups, uh, to thank all the NHS workers and carers throughout Hampshire for all the efforts they have made in combating COVID-19. And Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, members. Do you have questions for Councillor Huxley? Councillor Porter. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Huxley, I noticed that uh, in many of the uh, public announcements and press releases that we always concentrate on the care homes and the care workers in care homes. But actually, a lot of our residents are actually cared for by care workers going to their homes. And uh, I'm disappointed, really, that we haven't heard more of that in this. Uh, and it does actually tie up with uh, some of the hand washing comments in, earlier on in the uh, statement. I just wondered if you'd like to comment on how HASC is going to be looking at the uh, impact of COVID on care workers that go out to people's homes, both for the care workers themselves and the recipients of the care. Thank you for that question, uh, Councillor Porter. Um, I have actually convened a meeting to occur on Friday this week uh, to discuss how we might cover all the likely topics that are going to arise uh, because of the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, and once we've worked through those, uh, we'll let you know uh, how that will be progressed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Carew, I'm not sure if you were flagging in error or not, but I did see that for a moment you wanted to make a comment. Uh, Councillor that, that's correct, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I would just actually like to support Councillor Porter's um, request. Uh, I can say before my mother died, um, although we're extremely grateful for the excellent care we had from Hampshire County Council, um, some of the workers 
washed their hands, other care workers wore masks and gloves, some did neither. So I think we need some clear strategy um, and guidance for care workers, not just our own employees, um, but those of um, organisations that we um, use as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak before I note the report and move on? Good, then we note this report and we move on to item 15, which is um, the report from the leader on the County Council's responses to COVID and the, the uh, engagement board. So, uh, Councillor Manns, if you would like to give your report now, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, before I give my report, I have been trying to keep up with the chat box, and I do note the points that's been made by, uh, by, by about voting, um, and certainly I know that the Chief Executive is on that, and we'll see if we can make it a bit clearer for the reasons that were mentioned on the chat box. And also I note the recent comments about including care workers as well as care homes in what we say about what we do about social services. Um, this is the last item on the agenda as far as I know. It simply covers our response to COVID-19 and indeed more specifically approval for both the creation of the outbreak control plan and local outbreak engagement board and indeed just covering the regulations that covered the emergency decision-making process that we adopted at the beginning of the, 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 the pandemic. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any questions or debate? Councillor Porter. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you for the hybrid that was sent off to us. It's extremely helpful uh, and uh, certainly has saved the eyes after many, many hours sitting in front of a very small screen. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Any other comments or questions? We note the report from the leader. As far as I know, that brings us to the end of the meeting. And so therefore, I am going to ask the powers that be to stop the webcast.